Yeah, okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, two weeks ago, the Value Design Symposium would have taken place. Uh, however, due to the current missions, the symposium is postponed to a day later this year. Um, and that's why we set up this Value of Design talk. Um, as a short introduction, my name is Bente and next to me is Vera. Uh, we are both part of the Value of Design Committee. Uh, and besides us, we have two speakers. Uh, first, we have Ron Bakker from PLP Architecture, established in London. Uh, and secondly, we have Bill Baker from Skidmore, Owings and Merrill, and he's located in Chicago. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we noticed that their names are quite similar, but both will address a different part of the team, which will be natural versus digital. Uh, at first, Ron Bakker will talk about two proposed oak wood timber constructions uh, and about the tree house in Rotterdam. Uh, and with this, he will focus on the natural side of the team. Uh, his talk will be around 20 minutes and after all spectators uh, have the opportunity to ask their questions. Uh, next, Bill Baker will talk about the digital side of the team and he addresses the Burk Aliva, uh, some parts of the topology and shape optimization and some of the tools he works with at Zoom. Um, and again, you can ask your questions uh, and we will end this presentation uh, with a short debate. Um, lastly, to note, it's important to note that you can send in your questions via the chat at the YouTube channel. Uh, we have an extra screen and we will check all your questions and ask them directly to Ron and Bill. Uh, you can do this during the presentations or after the presentations. Um, yeah, just to feel free to ask everything. Um, yeah, and that's it for now. Uh, we hope you will all enjoy it and we will give the stage to Ron. Great, um, thank you very much, Vera and Bente. Um, uh, really glad to be staring at my screen and imagining lots of you at the other end of, of the other side of the of the wires and the waves. Um, um, and uh, it's very nice that this is talking about nature and um, and digital world. Uh, of course, you know, in the future we'll probably find that we need both very much and both working strongly together um, because I, um, you know, I'm quite convinced that that's the future of, uh, um, of the way we're going to look at cities and, and the design of buildings. To an extent that's already happening, of course, nothing is new. Um, I'm, I'm going to quickly introduce myself. My name is Ron Bakker. Um, I, I was Dutch about, until about 30 years ago when I decided to, uh, to live in a bigger city than Rotterdam and I moved to London. Um, I am a partner at PLP, at PLP Architecture, uh, which is a sort of medium-sized architectural firm in, in London. There's about 160, 170 of us. We don't go all to the same space like this. This is not true, okay? This is going to be, this is, this is uh, photoshopped largely. Um, but um, you can see we really enjoy being together and uh, we have a bit of a history um, of doing tall buildings in London and around the world. Um, not as much history as Bill, but um, um, we have created a couple of um, new buildings really that are also kind of new typologies of, uh, of office buildings. And um, this is one from some time ago, the Heron Tower, which was really a stacked uh, a series of smaller units, um, which is the first multi-user office building in London and the tallest at the time, where we're, we're um, completing quite soon, I think in the next few months, uh, 22 Bishopsgate, which is a new type office building altogether, um, uh, which encompasses all elements of, uh, of quality of life within office um, structures. So very different type of uh, uh, building again for the city of London. Um, and uh, you know, we're all looking forward to seeing and feeling what it's like on the inside. Um, we're working on uh, some of the tallest residential buildings in London and some new typologies. Again, um, this is for the collective, which is a, um, a building for starters on the housing market. There's a real shortage of good um, and affordable residential space in London. It's kind of uh, stifling growth, um, especially growth younger uh, professionals in London. So definitely something to look at. And the people in Holland will probably know me from uh, from the Edge, which which um, I designed with my colleagues um, uh, some time ago. It's uh, um, called um, the smartest building in the world by Bloomberg. 
So um, I, I, I didn't say that because I think, you know, there are smart parts to it. But uh, when we talk about smart buildings, I'm, I'm trying to see it in its huge, bigger shape, not just uh, wires and, uh, and AI. I think uh, it's important that we start looking at projects um, in a way that is more, uh, you know, has more layers of uh, quality thinking um, added to the process. Buildings are very important. Um, actually, buildings do a lot um, that uh, it happens even if we don't have buildings. And that is, uh, that is the point of the nature in architecture. This, this is one of my favorite places here, you know, and it's, uh, it's got all the elements of good architecture. It's got uh, um, some shelter from the tree. It has climate control, fresh air. Um, you know, some heating going on, there's, there's coffee, there's furniture, and it really makes a place for people to come together. And um, that is what architecture for the for the next 20 years is definitely going to be about. Um, and um, so for me, this is as much architecture um, as, uh, as a building, <clears throat> making great places. And the tandem between architecture and nature has always been around. We probably grew up in trees as a, as a species. We know that uh, um, Eve, um, you know, one of the, for, until recently, one of the oldest um, uh, Homo sapiens skeletons we found uh, had bone breaks um, um, when we dug her up. And uh, we've, we've, we've imagined that she slept in a tree and fell to her death. Um, and sleeping in a tree, you know, it's, it's, it seems hazardous, but actually it's a quite a safe place. So the trees um, have played a huge role in, uh, in, the, in the development of our, of our nature. Oh, that's a good pun. Um, and um, but through the history of um, of uh, us gaining knowledge, uh, we have um, as architects um, learned most uh, and in the moments that we connect it with other sciences um, and um, or with other trades and professions. And uh, in Gothic times, um, the the quality of um, um, generations of stonemasons uh, had meant that we could stack pieces of stone uh, in, in a phenomenally um, uh, inventive and, and sophisticated way. Uh, we, we could now probably not build um, Gothic cathedrals the way they did at the time. We've lost that knowledge. It was amazing. Um, but there, at the same time, it was an expression of uh, the grand nature of uh, of God and uh, and religion and making these beautiful tall spaces quite amazing. And it wasn't really until uh, Wren, uh, much later than the Gothic cathedrals, when um, we could determine structures mathematically. And there is a, I don't know if you can all see my uh, my cursor as well, maybe. Um, there is a there is a, um, a a line in the middle um, of the dome um, which carries the um, the turret in the top and that one was uh, was um, calculated mathematically that was really the first time that structures became calculated a big jump forward and it started to generate an architectural language an architectural style um, that was new uh, and uh, its development uh, meant real steps forward in architecture so we see this occasionally throughout history there was a moment in the beginning of the um, of the 20th century when we learned much about materials like steel and, and glass and concrete and started also to combine our um, architectural, this is of course Corbusier, um, our thinking about architecture in terms of uh, people's well-being, in terms of daylight and sunlight. And uh, this, uh, the Dutch uh, students will recognize this. Uh, building by Duiker in, in Amsterdam. It's an open air school. And uh, it, it seems a strange idea because one would now think that uh, daylight and fresh air uh, would be good elements for students. But there was a time when that was not the case. And there was a movement even where uh, uh, teachers were teaching children outside for most of the year because they felt it was better. Of course, they wouldn't get tuberculosis as much as they would inside buildings. Buildings were very unhealthy places, but we learned. Um, and the modern movement has uh, you know, thrown up some amazing architecture that uh, um, really was a, was a direct result of learning uh, from um, material engineering and from structural engineering. And um, these moments in architecture happen all the time. <clears throat> so. We're, we're, we're at the at the moment, I think, embarking on a, a whole new chapter uh, in that respect, because we are, as architects, collaborating much more closely 
uh, with the digital world, uh, with the world of uh, materials engineering, with the, with the psychologists and the socialists and um, the, the intention uh, of architecture is always to encompass as many of these amazing qualities as possible. So um, when we got phone call from the University of Cambridge, Dr. Michael Ramage, uh, whom you know, I think, Bill, um, uh, to ask us if we wanted to be involved in a theoretical design for a tall building made out of timber that was going to be 300 meters long. And did I want to think about that for a while? And I said, I've thought about it already. That's great. Let's do it. So we, um, we became part of this um, uh, um, quite a solid piece of research that the University of Cambridge did. Michael Ramage runs the, the Center for Natural Materials um, and he works with um, uh, Simon Smith of uh, Smith and Warbrook, um, Cambridge engineers often uh, on, on timber structures, but for tall buildings, so kind of a new chapter um, and um, a, a good one because timber uh, has um, a lot of potential as a very happy and healthy um, structural material uh, that we should use more and more because it's, it grows in forests. It, it uh, sequesters carbon when we, um, <clears throat> when we cut down a tree and we, um, we can use it to offset uh, uses of carbon uh, that we need elsewhere in the, in the construction process. We know of course that uh, the uh, construction produces something like 40% of, um, uh, of the carbon problem that we have on the planet, um, probably a little bit more if you count all the transport associated with it. Um, so working on the way we build um, to encounter that, that is uh, really quite a task that we should take very, very seriously. So um, all the other structural materials we know um, have a penalty to the carbon condition on the planet. And, uh, and wood is really the only one that can offset that slightly. It's the, the carbon count is negative. There's a little bit of energy used for drying the wood, but most of it is just holding on to, um, to carbon. So if you, um, uh, the red line is hopefully the line that we are going to be able to follow uh, to get to zero carbon in 2100, might be a bit late even. So we have to work a bit harder than that. And the gray blob is sort of our trajectory of what we, what we do at the moment. <clears throat> so turning that around by going negative in as many parts as we can, planting forest is an easy one that nobody's against, but there are many other ways to have uh, um, um, offset carbon with negative carbon. So go negative for once uh, really helps to bring that line down. Um, the structure performance of wood is better than uh, we, we ever thought. There is um, um, you know, wood uh, has the problem that it's a natural material in a way because it has, uh, you know, strange things happen to it. We have knots, there are parts that are better and parts that are worse. But the way we, um, we use engineered timber now, which is timber that's basically chopped up and put together again in such a way that we can now control the quality uh, of the elements. Every time you buy a sheet or a, um, a, a long piece of um, laminated timber, it, the quality is well understood. So we can start to use it um, as a material for, for more serious uh, uh, structural performance. And weight by weight, it's doing really well compared to steel and concrete. It's slightly uh, stronger um, than steel. That seems strange, but the, you know it's also about five times bigger. So you imagine full weight, um, it works. Um, and steel, of course, its stiffness is, uh, is premium to anything else. But wood is always a lot better than concrete in many, many ways. <clears throat> um, there are other associated benefits. We, it's much uh, easier to transport. You don't need as much truck movement in a city building, a big building, if you make it out of wood instead of concrete. And it, it's potentially faster to build. The elements can be made um, in the factory and put together. Um, and in, in Cambridge, they are also working with the industry to um, to test wood in all sorts of different ways to, uh, to understand even better its, uh, its potential and its uh, um, behavior in strange, strange conditions, like putting lots of weight on it or, um, or setting it alight and what happens, we, we are more and more understanding the material. Um, and uh, the timber tower projects uh, that we, we designed with, with this group um, were analyzed in, in the same way that one would analyze a concrete or a, or a steel structure tall building. So um, it is, it, it, this is all to do mostly with the wind force and the, 
and the, uh, the the plastic behavior of a very large tower uh, under the influence of the wind force. Um, timber is a bit of a problem because it's so light, um, so the wind has a, a stronger um, impact on it. If you like, it's it has less inertia. So the um, if the wind hits a timber tower, it tends to flap more than a, than a, a, a concrete or a steel tower, not because it's stiffer or less stiff, but because of its weight. Um, so you have to treat it slightly differently, but on the whole, the, the materials behave very, very similarly. Um, so the first timber tower in the Barbican um, in, in London, uh, we had to find a location. It's not actually for sale, that piece of land. I think it's a beautiful garden inside the Barbican, but um, it was only an example. But the 300 meter tall tower is, uh, is really uh, five elements that are buttresses um, and they are placed together to uh, support each other. Um, and uh, the buttresses take the, the lateral uh, force of, of the wind. The columns get very large at the base. They're about two and a half by two and a half meters. Um, they're huge pieces of laminated timber, but uh, it works. And of course, it's not a new thing. You know, the structure of the dome in St. Paul's Cathedral is, is an oak, uh, beautiful oak structure that has been sitting there for hundreds of years, doing just fine. Thank you very much. If you, pre if you protect uh, the wood well, it can last as long as any other uh, construction material. Now, one of our clients in Holland um, uh, of a, a developer called Perfast um, saw our news in the papers about the first inventory in the Barbican and said, hey, you know, we, can, can we do one in Holland? And um, so we tried. Uh, this was a project that was stepping slightly into the um, um, into the zone of reality um, because we were aiming to build a tower of about 135 meters, slightly taller than the tallest tree. You know, the tallest uh, redwoods in California are 115 meters, I, I believe. So um, that stands up quite happily by itself. Um, so we should be able to engineer a tower that can go quite that high. This was a very different proposition. This was a basket um, structure um, with um, with a diagonal, uh, it's a diagonal braced fabric, almost that would take the wind load in that way, which was actually very complicated and also very beautiful. Um, the problem was, um, uh, although we tried that the structure of the building was really still very much more expensive than a typical concrete uh, residential structure in The Hague. And we didn't create enough value uh, with the tower to be able to afford that. Uh, so it now, rather than a technical problem, it was more seen as a, as a commercial problem, which is a, you know, a big win already. <clears throat> it was a beautiful building. We looked very much into the relationship between people and wood as a material. People feel very happy, um, and, and that's been proven in uh, in research. People um, people's heart rate go down if in the with the proximity of uh, of wood. They feel less stressed. Um, brain capacity apparently is increased if you live among lots of wood. Uh, don't ask me how. I have no idea how that works, but it's it's good news and it's a nice material. Nobody really dislikes wood, I think. So we kept going. Um, we, uh, we did another uh, a project that has potential um, as a reality um, in, uh, along the river in Rotterdam, a beautiful location slightly outside of Rotterdam's uh, high rise zone, and that was the problem. <clears throat> but um, it was partly um, just bringing the conversation to the fore, uh, designing a building that this time felt also feasible. Um, so we, we had to control the way we used pieces of wood and build up the structure of the building so that it might get into the realm of the affordable. Um, and this time a tower of about 160, 165 meters tall, um, which uh, we're, you know, we're still looking at um, to see whether that might become a real project. Um, similarly, we analyzed how the building is put together, how it works. I mean, we, haven't, we don't have the illusion that we have resolved all the issues. We're going to run into lots of trouble putting these, uh, these structures together as, you know, we did when I'm saying we, I wasn't actually there, but um, when um, the first steel structure, structures were built in the 19th century, um, there's a lot of development of ideas to be done, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's worth pursuing. And um, it always creates a type of architecture that people feel really quite close to. Um, and um, it, uh, it's, it's a beautiful potential for the future. Now, Rotterdam um, it claims to be a bit of a high-rise city, um, in, uh, at least in the Netherlands. Actually, Rotterdam's 
um, our skyline is in the front here against the skyline with you know some of some of Bill's uh, buildings. Um, it's really quite a different scale. But uh, I think the tallest building in Rotterdam is in the order of 165 meters, 170. So um, for for the Netherlands, quite uh, quite tall in comparison with uh, Amsterdam and and The Hague, um, but uh, not of the order of the of, of uh, China and the Middle East <clears throat> and the States. But Rotterdam's history, of course, has the building called the White House, um, which has a steel and iron structure and a, and a thick concrete core in the middle to take the wind force, uh, all of its uh, 14 levels, I think, or no, it's 10 levels, 43 meters tall. It was once the tallest um, building in, in Europe. Um, uh, that wasn't the church steeple. It's the, the highest floor plate in Europe and finished just before the beginning of the 20th century. So Rotterdam has a bit of a history in doing skyscrapers and of course, mo most of their history was uh, was mowed down in the, in um, uh, 1940 when the the center of the city was practically taken out over you know the, the war ever only ever lasted one day in Holland people say because it uh, it was it's finished after the bombardment of Rotterdam very little left and it created um, a zone within the um, within the red line that we call the fire zone, because that was the part of Rotterdam that was wiped out. Uh, before that, Rotterdam was a, a city with a similar structure to Delft and, and, uh, and Amsterdam with canals and beautiful uh, uh, patterns. Um, and this has given uh, Rotterdam almost a license to be the, 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 the most modern town, you know, if you like, in the, in the Netherlands. And um, the, uh, the tall building uh, zones are res restricted to this fire zone. So, um, there's, there is a, that's the relationship between um, historic um, Rotterdam and the future. So very many buildings along the river um, on the islands um, and uh, the tallest buildings are there, uh, but also around the station in the, in the north where we um, were uh, part of a competition to design a mixed use building next to the station. And together with Provas, the company I mentioned before that we did the studies with, um, and we decided to um, to see whether we could take uh, the use of wood for structure uh, into the into the into the realm of the realities. Um, and we seem to be managing to do that quite well. Um, we um, designed a building that's very much mixed use, but kind of a new um, a new form because we're really mixing uses um, throughout the section of the building. And the architecture, I mean, this was early studies, of course, it's not going to be like this, but the architecture sort of very much reminded us of, uh, of the planked nature of, uh, of wood, you know, um, the stepping, the horizontal layering, uh, pieces sticking out, um, which is kind of a very um, natural way to look at buildings made out of wood. Um, eventually, just before Christmas, we won uh, this competition. So we are now designing the building. Um, it's the intention that we start construction in the summer of next year. Um, and the building is uh, architecturally made out of slabs of, uh, of wood. Um, and, um, but it's a, it's a stacked building with stacked function. So it has a retail uh, cafe base with an event space uh, where 300 people can come together 350 times a year for TED talks and music and, and theater. Um, then it has a chunk of office space and above it a residential tower. And because these um, elements all have a different nature, um, we looked at uh, the best, the most sustainable and uh, um, the, the, the most feasible way of structuring different parts of the building. Um, of course, we're next to the station. Um, so we have to deal with um, uh, vibrations caused by the railway. Um, which do not usually allow you to build residential very near because there is a you know the vibrations travel through the structure and make noise um, and um, so typically uh, the heavy weight of concrete is the best way to conquer that uh, we also have interesting um, um, uh, geo uh, geo um, conditions geotechnical conditions we have a um, sand layer at about 30 meters i believe uh, which we cannot put too much pressure on. It's too weak for a real heavy, um, small building. So the, uh, controlling the weight of the building is very helpful in, uh, in the design of the foundations. Um, 
so we, we ended up designing a building that has a concrete base and then has a transfer structure, which now happens um, a little bit higher. And then the residential part of the building, the top 100 meters more or less, um, has a, a structure made of wooden columns and beams and um, CLT slabs. So it's a, it's a fully uh, wooden um, residential structure with a concrete core in the middle that rises out of the base of the building and provides the lateral stability. Um, so we, in this case, we chose not to be too um, religious about um, uh, promoting timber, but using materials in the building um, that are fit for purpose. Um, so wherever we can, we will exchange uh, materials for ones that are better for the environment, um, but um, not against um, common sense. So it's a kind of, a, you know, it's a very uh, realistic and uh, a very good um, uh, condition, I think, to, to look at architecture. Um, in the Netherlands, there is a, a bit of a battle going on, a competition between cities to provide the, the greenest and the most uh, sort of environmentally sustainable projects, which is really healthy. Um, the cities will choose um, buildings that behave better towards the environment in the city um, um, against buildings that don't. Um, but of course, they all have to be uh, within uh, the realm of the feasible in terms of uh, commercial aspects and in terms of usability. Um, we still have a, um, a few things to work out. The structure seems to work rather well. Uh, we are controlling fire. Uh, fire, of course, is one of the quick issues that people uh, worry about when you look at timber. Um, but um, the, the, the risks can all really be dealt with. It's not, um, not as hard as you think. It's a sprinkler building and, and wood. I, if you've ever tried to light a big chunk of wood, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, so controlling the, the source of the fire is really um, the aspect. Um, it, it's just as, just as dangerous as a steel structure building or a concrete building on fire. Um, what, we, what we haven't worked out yet is uh, what materials to use for the cladding um, of the building on the outside, the balconies. Because um, we, we realized that that's a, um, a piece of the building with a big volume as well. So why wouldn't that be negative carbon either? So we're looking for a negative carbon cladding material that's made out of uh, natural sources that is, uh, has a good fire rating, that, is, uh, that you don't have to paint every 10 years because uh, that is too difficult. So we still have that task ahead of us. It's very exciting. And I think if we, if we find that material, then um, we, we are on our way. Um, every, uh, we haven't found anybody yet who it doesn't like the expression of the building. It's, it's very open and, and transparent, but it's also very warm. And uh, the two together are quite wonderful. So just uh, quickly images to show um, the structure of the building. It's got a concrete base for our big spans in the offices, um, concrete core rising out of that and uh, uh, columns and slabs made of wood. Um, and this is how we build it up. We have the wood spans are shorter, so they're quite, it's quite good residential material, but not so for uh, large floor plates. Um, be besides this, my time must be up. Um, besides this, um, um, the building is as green as you can be collecting all the rainwater. We have um, two and a half thousand square meters of photovoltaics on the balconies everywhere on the sunny sides of the buildings. We are collecting even the water that falls onto the roof of the station. They have a bit too much there, so it doesn't need to be drained away. We use it for flushing toilets and for having showers and for irrigation. Um, we have uh, two basements, but we park no cars. We have about 5,000 spaces for bicycles in the, in the basement. That's the intention. Um, we are talking to the city of taking some of their bicycle parking problem away from the station. So we, uh, it's a building that will fit in beautifully with the, uh, with the rest of the city and also will actually have a positive um, um, benefit for the place around it. Thank you. Cool. Yes. Um, yes. Okay, we are back. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation, first of all. Um, there is a kind of weird thing with your sound. It gives a lot of noise when you move, we think. So oh, okay. uh, it's, it's, awesome. it's, it's nice if you try not to move too much. So we think that <laughs> it's better in that way. Um, and 
uh, well, first of all, we had a question uh, because we read uh, online that there is also a big focus on demountability within the building. Um, and we were wondering, like, what is the difference between the theoretical and practical reuse? Because we can imagine that on front, you think that you could reuse a lot or use a lot of reused material. Um, but we were wondering if that's really happening in the end, or do you have any experience with that? Um, no, the, the, the thinking about circularity, and that's part of the, uh, the thinking about circular economies is to, uh, on the one hand, try and reuse materials that are available in, in other buildings, um, donor buildings, which we are doing for this project. We are, um, uh, we're, we're, at the moment, we're looking at several buildings that are in the same ownership as this building is going to be and within a certain range of distance where we can reuse buildings from the uh, materials from those buildings. But in practice, um, that will be largely finishes, interior finishes, those kind of uh, uses for, for products. Because buildings, frankly, were not put together to be uh, disassembled in the future when we built them in the 60s and 70s. Um, so the, the motto now is no, don't glue um, anything to anything else in the building and make sure that the, the, it can be taken to pieces again in the future. Um, but we're also looking at circularity. Um, you know, there are lift, su lift suppliers now who you can lease a, a lift set from and they take care of the lifts during their lifetime. They also promise to reuse parts of it and reuse materials for uh, in the future. Um, you know, buildings are consisting of elements, some of which will stand for 100 years um, and some of which need to be replaced every 30 years or every 15 years or every five years. Um, uh, five years, not so many. You can sit on a chair for more than five years and it will still function. But facades, for instance, they're not designed to last much longer than 25 years or 20 years. Um, and um, the mechanical systems in buildings have sh even shorter lifetimes. So elements um, that are in there, they should really be designed so that they can be reused. And it's often a choice of material and it's often a choice of putting them together. It's very theoretical at the moment, but it's important that big projects like this uh, play a part in that theory and are narratives for the way we should look at buildings. So, you know, uh, even if we cannot solve everything in the one single building, um, talking about it and, uh, and publishing and, uh, and learning from people um, and collaborating with, uh, with scientists is very important in that respect. Okay, that's a clear answer. Uh, we received four questions in the YouTube chat and the first is from Herman uh, and he asks, uh, how does the carbon footprint of turning timber into a laminated timber, is it significant? Sorry, but when you when you leaned forward, I lost your voice a bit. Oh, uh, how about the carbon footprint of turning timber into a laminated timber? Uh, is it significant? Um, there is um, there is some waste uh, when when obviously when you cut wood um, to put it back together into laminated um, 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 materials um, often a lot of that uh, waste is used um, in the process uh, as, as an energy source for the drying of timber um, that's not entirely kosher what you know um, it would be better to um, uh, to use it in different ways and people are looking at that you can make glues out of uh, timber for instance and you can use uh, the, that material for other um, other, other um, elements but the, um, there is a bit of carbon involved with chopping the wood into um, into smaller pieces and gluing them back together again, but it 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 it's outweighed entirely by uh, you know uh, the, allowing the tree to grow for fifteen or twenty years and, and sequestering carbon and then holding onto it by using the timber. Um, that is really where the the big gains are made. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the next question is from Denise. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Um, and he asks, um, why are we using timber uh, as a building material? Is there a better material which has a better carbon footprint? No, there isn't. No, it's just timber is the best. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. 
and, and it's precisely for that, you know, timber is not, uh, it's nothing to do with deforestation or cutting down beautiful ancient forests. It's a, it's a crop, it's agriculture. And you grow the wood in a plantation um, and it gets cut down. Uh, there's so much wood grown in Europe already that uh, has no, uh, no future actually at the moment because we don't use so much anymore in the, in the paper industry. So countries like Sweden and, uh, and Austria and Switzerland have so much wood growing that really needs to go somewhere because when you cut down a tree, you plant a few more, then the process of sequestering carbon starts again. You know? So you, the, the, the idea of growing it and then using it and holding on to it is uh, very valuable. That's the valuable thing for the environment. And I can't think of another material that would um, that does that. I don't think it exists. Yeah. You know, even uh, bricks, making brick buildings is quite good. It, it, uh, it has quite a low carbon um, count, but it's a heavy material. It doesn't work very efficiently structurally. Um, and you have to cook it, you know, there's a lot of energy involved in making good quality bricks. Yeah. Mm, okay. So all our new projects will be made out of timber. <laughs> Exactly. Um, we have a next question from Beth, and he asks, do you see a future in living structures, for example, using living trees as construction material instead of timber? Yeah, lovely idea. And I think um, yeah. the idea of, uh, of growing um, parts of cities is, is uh, you know, it's a theoretical idea that we love to um, uh, to dream about because uh, I, I think eventually the, the connection between nature and the, and the hard world of, of stuff um, is going to um, get broken down. Uh, um, we, we will hopefully grow more foods in the city. We will, uh, we will use green in the city to create better environments and clean the air. And I think there's a lot of uh, syn synthesis that could happen between um, um, uh, nature and uh, and the hard materials in the city um, growing it's not impossible what we sometimes talk about is whether we can have that we can um, almost genetically manipulate trees you know we if it's uh, if it's corn or a spinach that we like to manipulate that's that doesn't sound like a very good idea in principle because uh, of the risks involved for for people um, or for, for agriculture in a larger scale. But if you're careful, you can get trees to grow wood that's more dependable, for instance, um, or um, that is stronger. Um, there are a lot of people uh, in universities thinking about processes of, uh, of growing building materials. It's not just wood, there, there's uh, hemp or bamboo and uh, lots of other uh, plants that we can use in the construction industry. And then from a uh, from a transport perspective, it you know it makes sense to do that near cities. But um, I think again that is not it's not you know it's not helpful to have to take um, wood out of uh, Switzerland and transport it by truck uh, to Rotterdam. But the penalty on the environment is much much smaller than what you gain by using the material in the first place. So you have to look at these things in balance. Uh, growing. It's yeah, science fiction, but absolutely a, a direction to uh, to consider. Okay, thank you. Um, we have three questions left, but I will ask one question for now, and maybe we can do the other ones at the end. Um, sure. Matt asked, uh, you spoke about the evidence of being in a timber building is beneficial to the users, but do you also look at how safe people feel in a building, especially in a city like London after Grenfell? Yeah, yeah, it's a huge question, and uh, you know, there's a consultation going on um, in in the UK at the moment um, about the um, regulations that have been written uh, since the disaster with Grenfell Tower, and um, it in many architects uh, pers from many architects' perspectives and and to people who you know worry about sustainable uh, building, uh, it's leaning too much towards the cautious. It's now actually no longer possible in the, in the UK to use timber pretty much whatsoever in construction that's higher than two floors high. I think even we've made great progress in building buildings of, of eight, nine, ten stories out of CLT. It's uh, it's 
really what we need to do, it makes no sense to use concrete for, for a building that is seven or eight stories tall. It's easier to do, but it makes no sense from an environmental uh, perspective. But um, Grenfell has uh, started, I suppose, to look at it positively um, as a stage where we need to be even more careful in making decisions about safety of people in the built environment. But it feels for the wood, um, the thinking about wood as a structural material, it feels like a big step back. It's going to take a long time. Um, and um, I think one has to um, weigh the benefits. You know, I, I live in a Victorian house in London. It's it's like the structure is 70% uh, wood, you know, and a few bricks here and there, but it's a wooden house, really. The floors, the, you know, the beams, the, 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 this, most of the walls are made out of wood. It's, uh, it's not new. It's what we've done for hundreds of years. And my house, if I make a little campfire, yes, it's going to go down, you know. And um, I'm not saying we should learn to live with the risks of wood, of wood going on fire in buildings, but um, we have to find a balanced view. And I think the issues in Grenfell were much, much more serious um, than, than, the, than the combustibility of the materials. Um, we could not have guessed uh, apparently that uh, this was going to happen. It, the recladding was done uh, without much thought. Um, and um, it was a big, 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 big mistake um, made by very many um, parts of the construction industry. And it's very good that we are now very conscious of that and consider each of these decisions for what they're worth. Yeah. Slightly okay. evasive answer, I'm sorry, but um, yeah. there's a, it's a very political discussion. Yeah, I get that. Um, yeah. No. So uh, before uh, we move on to the, to the presentation of Bill, we have one more uh, question for Ron. Um, imagine you would be able to design a high rise of 800 meters at the location where the tree house will be located now. What would it look like? Would you do the same or would you do it totally different? Wow, 800, that'll be... <laughs> that'll be about six times as tall as uh, any building in Rotterdam. Um, yeah, I mean, that is, a, that is a, an entirely different... Um, a proposition um, and you know um, in our office the, uh, some of the uh, younger architects tend to talk about buildings of 145 meters as mid-rise you know as opposed to high-rise because it's a bit low uh, but it really depends on how you look at it but uh, you know Bill is Bill is going to tell you that you know anything over 250 300 meters every single time is really really difficult they are really complicated really sophisticated types of building so in wood um, it's the theory is the same whether you use wood or steel or concrete in a way it has its own problems and its own benefits um, I think the problems are um, are, uh, are very hard to overcome at that sort of height so I would love to in Rotterdam. I I don't. Uh, the, the it's not it's not always beneficial. Now you've lost me, really, haven't you? That's my headphones are. Oh, we can hear. Okay, um, it's not always um, um, a um, it's not always a good solution. You know, um, I think uh, for some places it's very good to have very tall buildings. Density is good, and they are very much. Um, products of mankind's in ingenuity, you know, which is uh, actually an important thing to do. Um, but from other perspectives, it doesn't always make sense. That's true. So uh, with this, we move on to the presentation of uh, Bill. And uh, Ron, later on in the final discussion, we will uh, again have some questions for both of you. Uh, okay. So I will now again um, share my screen. Let's see. Yes, and Bill, you can now uh, take remote control of my screen. Yes. Okay. All right. Let's see how that works. Okay. Uh, so, so you you can hear me. Okay, good. All right. Anyway, thank you very much. I enjoyed, Ron, I enjoyed your presentation quite a bit. Uh, the, uh, and I think it's a very important topic uh, now. And I, and I like the title uh, that you, you gave. Uh, originally, it was, it was, 
I of course I had to change the title. Uh, it, it was uh, I think the title you were working with the digital uh, or natural. So I said digital and natural. Uh, because I, one of the things I, I, I see in the work that we do is that uh, a lot of times, if you if you really study the problem closely, you end up with solutions which are very natural, uh, you, you know, and 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 not necessarily and, and not uh, shall we say uh, artificially done. And, and so uh, you know, and so that you know the challenge that we have. Let's see how that goes. Let's go back. See if my slide shows. Anyway, uh, on this blank screen, you should be seeing a uh, something that's a challenge. I'll read it to you from my, my little script here on the side, which is the challenge is to create ideas and technologies that will lead to new subs, uh, substantive architecture. And that's that's what we that's what we're, we're looking looking to do here is is come up with ways that that we can have new architecture that's that's different, perhaps, but different because it's better. And and so because we're talking about natural, one of the things I wanted to talk about is issues of issues of scale. And uh, and I really like this um, uh, this 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 image uh, of, of, the, of these the, these two images, which is uh, on the left is a, a diagram that was actually made by Galileo. Uh, he he was uh, anomaly the first structural theorist of the modern era, if you wish to call it, and he was de de dealing with issues of scale, you know. And, and clearly, you know, this, you know, as things change in size, and this applies to architecture, it also, uh, you know, applies to nature and architecture almost equally. And if you look at, um, at uh, Darcy Thompson's uh, book, which I hope all of you have a copy of, uh, on growth and form, which is, you know, uh, uh, Darcy Thompson was a biologist. Uh, but it, I would almost say he was more of an engineering mechanics uh, person because he would look at why do things look like they do uh, based on uh, and basically is based on the physics of, of their environment. And that should also apply to buildings, uh, you know. And so um, if I look at the bone structure of this uh, of this uh, small animal, I believe this is, this is maybe a dog or a cat and, and compare it to the to the bone structure uh, of a um, of an elephant, you know, you certainly get this proportional changing that's going on, but it's even more important than that. And for me, a, a reference is is Myron Goldsmith, who is an architect and an engineer, did some very important work. And his um, uh, his his master's thesis, which he did with Mies van der Rohe in 1953 or thereabouts, uh, it, it, it is very important. And so, you know, Mies was arguably the most important architect of his era. And 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 Myron Goldsmith uh, went on to become a, a very important. Um, uh, you know, eventually, uh, uh, he, he wandered between engineering and architecture. Eventually, ended up uh, as a design partner at SOM, doing some of our the best work that we we've, we've ever done. And he um, and in his, in his master's thesis, he had uh, this chart. Okay. And, and if you read his master's thesis, and he always considered this to be the first piece of his professional body of work, uh, it, it was about what is the right system? What is the right species, if you will? What is the right species of animal depending on the problem? So he had this chart of, of bridges and depending on, on the span of the bridge, you'd have a different uh, solutions. And what's quite, quite remarkable in the thesis, uh, it, it, they never discussed the aesthetics because of course they were gonna make it beautiful. They were going to detail the heck out of it and, and, and just make it as elegant as possible. But 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 what what is, what is the fundamental topology? And what I like about this chart is what is missing. What kind of bridge do you, do you not see there? Cable state. Because you know cable state bridges, even though they existed before uh, fifty three, were not very common. But after after the World War II. And all those uh, bridges were being built across the Rhine. The Cable State Bridge came in. And what I like about our world is, unlike uh, nature, where things evolve from one to the other, we can create whole new species out of nothing, out of only the creativity of the design team and, and the understanding of physics. You, we can we can we can leapfrog and create a whole whole new species, and, and without having just to, to evolve one from another. And, 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 you, and you see this scale uh, in architecture. On the left is a little house uh, we engineered with the Tom Pfeiffer out of New York, where you can see the, the columns are 60 millimeters square. 
Okay, <laughs> uh, it's all a bar stock. And and then, but on the right is is, is the Willis Tower, the Sears Tower, where where these are roughly 900 millimeters wide. And so, it's just like the, the the bones of the dog versus the elephant, you you, you see that you, you see that in in architecture. Now. Um, Here's a chart, uh, just like the, the spanning chart we saw for the bridges. This is a, a chart that we often use as kind of a, for a discussion about what it is. What is it that um, that uh, you know? What are the what is the correct species, or or, or what applicable range does does the does the species have, uh, depending on on the height? And and if you look at uh, you know tall buildings over time, you know you know. Uh, there was there was somewhat of an evolution, but I have to say on the Burj Khalifa we kind of created a new species uh, that that enabled it to go forward. And if and if you look at look at this tower, and you look at the, um, uh, the you know uh, the, the system, uh, it is not timber, by the way. Uh, <laughs> it is primarily reinforced concrete with a bit of steel at the top, uh, and it is 828 meters tall. Um, the a little over half mile, uh, and and so uh, you know as as we looked at this, uh, you know, and we, and we tried to go to go to the to this great height, uh, we had to come up with a different species. Now, um, if I were if to become, say, I was to grow twice as tall, I would have to be twice as wide and twice as thick, and my weight would go up by eight times. Okay, you know, you can't, you can you cannot scale me. At some point, it doesn't work. Uh, you know, um, and, and the same thing is true of tall buildings. That if we had taken the Sears Tower, that now called the Willis Tower, and scaled it up to the height of the of the Burj Khalifa, it would scale by the cube, just like you know any point tower. And, and because of that, it just doesn't work. There's way too much real estate, way too much floor area. You're, you know, you, you could argue even in the Willis Tower, you're pretty far from the window anyway, 22 and a half meters at, at, at times, which is quite quite a distance. Uh, you know, it'd be just ridiculous uh, if you scaled it up. And so, uh, so addressing the issues of scale during the design, we came up with a system that only has to scale, uh, uh, scale by the square. If I make it twice as tall, I'll have twice as many floors. I also have to make the, the legs longer, the three wings longer, but I don't need to make them wider. And, and, and because of that, I was able uh, to, to, to take, take something that we were able to, to make a, a, you know, quite, quite a bit taller. And, and so, you know, this just gives you, and where all the space is usable. I mean, uh, you know, over here, as I said, on the, on the Willis Tower, you know, the distance between the core uh, and the perimeter is 22 and a half meters. Here, it's on the order of, you know, nine, uh, nine, nine to 11 meters, just like any residential tower. And so, you know, so, uh, you know, we created this new species that we, we uh, that we, we had to, we gave it a name. Uh, one of the things I think is very interesting in the design process, and we do this quite a bit, um, at the beginning of the design process, everything, it's a free for all. Lots of ideas are thrown out there. But when you're getting close to the end and you think you really have something, try to describe what you did in words. And if it takes a lot of words to describe it, Maybe you're not there yet. Uh, you, you know, you know. Maybe you, you, know, you need to keep editing your, your design and and bring it down to the intellectual essence of it. And uh, and sometimes you can get down to two words: a noun plus an adjective. The Sears Tower is called a bundled tube. Uh, the Burj Khalifa is a buttressed core. And that is the intellectual essence of, of the structural system. And so you have this, this hexagonal core in the middle, which takes care of the torsion because you don't want this thing spinning uh, when the wind hits it. And then it's, then it's stiffened by these buttresses that go down essentially the, uh, the, the corridor is coming off of, off of the core. And, and once, you, once you get your ideas that clear and you can, you can, you can clear, clarify it in your own mind and then you, can, you, you and your colleagues can work together and you can explain it to the contractor and to the other disciplines and to the owner. And when you have to, have to resolve conflicts and because tall buildings are all about conflicts, uh, it gives you an idea as to how, uh, how you, you can resolve the conflicts and who gets to the right of way or, or the, the hierarchy. Um, the, um, and uh, 
And if, if you guys do want to build one in Rotterdam, uh, Ron and I will work together on that, okay? <laughs> Okay. Uh, okay, but uh, not, not not only in in, in the uh, in the systems uh, in, the, in the global systems, but also in uh, called this uh, uh, scale and form. Sometimes the it's in it's in just the systems itself, and we've been doing a quite a, quite a bit of research on on um, on the on the geometry of structures, and uh, and how loads want to flow, and they want to flow in a natural manner. And and what you see here, uh, this is a high waisted X bracing, okay, and it, and it had and, and we found this from our topology studies, and it, it's related to, and I'll show you in a minute, about how loads want to flow. They want to flow gently, and depending on the density of your pattern, you know, you'll have the same thing. But the load comes in, and it wants to it, the wind load comes in laterally, and then it wants to turn gently to the vertical. Uh, and we and we find this uh, from our from our our uh, our, uh, our studies on, on on structural systems, and you end up with, with I think architecture, uh, which is you know uh, new and different and more efficient, um, and, and and creates new opportunities uh, for 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 architecture and, and design. Uh, you know, you know, of course, you know, efficiency and economy. You know, the the, the environment. You know, is, you know, we're all very very very. Uh, clear about the problems we have here. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there's the background here blocked out some of my stuff, but I'll just tell you what it, what it says, which is uh, here are two trusses. And the only difference between the two trusses, uh, you know, normally this has a white background. So for the, anyway, uh, uh, the, uh, if, if you look at these two trusses, uh, they're both three to one cantilevers. And they're doing exactly the same job. But the one on the left, and the only difference between the two is ge geometry, or shall I say architecture. Now, the one on the left needs 60% more material for the same deflection as the one on the right. And I, I encourage all of you, uh, you know, you've all had your structural engineering class, uh, uh, size, th take these two geometries, a three to one cantilever and size them for the same deflection. And you will find that this one over needs here needs 60% more material. Not six percent, sixty percent. So talk about you know you know uh, carbon footprint and and doing it, and, and so um, it, it is it is very important. And it comes from the the, the body of, of work which are called uh, Mitchell trusses. And 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 these this is a paper from 1904 about minimum low pass structures. And you'll see these things; they look very organic. And, and what's what's interesting to note? Uh, so he, here's this truss with the point load and, and two supports that the load in this perimeter never changes. It just turns very gently. If I look at this unusual looking cantilever, the load turns gently to the support. If I, if I, look, if I look at the, this truss, which there's a point load here in the middle to see this F and the two reactions at A and B, the force in the cord turns gently. It goes up and goes around at this quarter of a bicycle wheel then back down. And so, you know, you know, that's the interpretation we're giving to, to this thing that we're, we're discovering from nature, and we're, we're finding out these geometries. Uh, this is a, a minimum load path um, uh, cantilever. Uh, you know, the, the ones you saw before. Uh, unfortunately, there's an infinite number of members. You know, your fabricators always get upset when you specify an infinite number of members. So, uh, you know, uh, if you do a discrete number of members, we found that this is the geometry and you can describe this entire shape with one angle. Uh, and, and nature is very, very organized. We just have to look for it and find it. And then how do we, how do we make it to architecture? Because you don't take that stuff directly. You, know, you, you, you have to interpret it. And so, um, uh, unfortunately, my text just appeared here. But uh, let me uh, tell you the way we do it. We create a little vocabulary. In the over here is a is a rectangle. We call that our design space. And we have, in the words of geometry, we have three things we look at. One is topology, and and here we use it in a structural sense, uh, which is what is connected to what. And then shape. How do how does that topology get shaped to be more efficient? And then how do you size the members? And uh, as a, for the structural engineers in the class, do not spend your life only down here on sizing the members. Uh, the most important structural decisions are made up here in the topology and shape, which is what we call architecture. And, 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 and so I urge you all, you know, the architects, all those who are gonna go into architecture, all those who can go into engineering, uh, 
to have this conversation early because uh, you know, if you go back to that uh, three to one cantilever, I don't care how smart you are at sizing the members or designing the connections, you cannot get beyond a bad geometry. And so, uh, you know, th th this, is, this is very important. We have, we have a series of tools that we use in the office, um, uh, it, but basically, uh, you know, design, you know, th th these tools uh, don't give us a, a, a um, an answer that is like the best answer. I, I, you know, a lot of times uh, people think that when you do like optimization, you come up with the one answer. No, optimization is to give the design team ideas that, that, that they as designers can then interpret in, into, uh, into what they do. And let me show you some of the tools uh, that, that we do. Uh, you, know, you, know, at, at, you know, we use the, these topology tools. Uh, you know, we, 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 we create a design space and then we grow structures. And, and then we see, do we get some ideas uh, from, from the, this, uh, the, the structure? This is, you know, a load on the top. And, and uh, you might say that on the, on, at the top is where to put the members and at the bottom is where to put the holes. And depending on the filters, you get, you get different answers. And, and you're not gonna build any of these, but it may give you, give you ideas of things that you, you, that you might do. And, you, and I do feel that these are all very natural. And just like I mentioned before, that you know the, the, these studies we've we've done. This is a building we just finished in Australia, uh, and it, and it's and it's based on turning the loads gently. Uh, the uh, you, you know you, you can have a problem which which you you're not familiar with, and you you'll see things that'll happen. Uh, you can see this Mitchell wheel growing here, and, and the like. And and can you as a designer take that and interpret it and come up with something new, and unique? Or by just by changing the boundary conditions, where you support it. Here, look at this arch that's growing here, and look at the hangers. The hangers are not vertical, and and look at this spot, this this little spur that's growing out there. You know how how can you as designers, structural and architectural designers, take that and do something different? Uh, you, you know, you know, we also do do this in in three dimensional space. Uh, and when I look at these things, the I don't take this as a what is the solution. I it, I take it as a solution that I need to understand why is it why is it the solution? Because one of the great things about design is actually changing the problem. Uh, you, you know where, where you come up uh, where you know you know why are, why are the branches only at the top? And if and if you look at this arch in elevation, you'll see it's actually funicular. It's not a smooth curve. It's funicular. And, and so you know you know you know the, the, these tools can give you. And talking about looking like nature, that was that was pretty. It looked like nature, right? Uh, another tool we use a lot is uh, you take a bunch of dots and you connect them to their neighbors, and you connect them to their neighbors, to the neighbors, the neighbors, to the neighbors, and 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 you run the the the. Uh, then you put a load on it and see see what kind of results you get. And guess what? Let's, so let's see what we grow here. A Mitchell truss. And, 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 and so you, 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 you can see this and you, and you can use other tools. And here's, here's another tool. And it grows another Mitchell truss, but slightly different because the tools are not perfect. And, and, then they, and I like that. I like that they're fuzzy because that means you as the designer has to insert yourself and, and make it into something that, 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 is, that is architectural. And, and, you know, and as it refines, it comes into focus. Okay, so, you know, you know um, so we do this uh, in our in our designs. Uh, you know, we will get we'll perhaps having have uh, two different. Uh, we'll use one tool. We'll get an answer like this. Um, I'm, I missed a slide here, but basically, uh, we took I took a problem and we looked at it two different ways. And one of the answers was this, and we came up with this. Okay, and if I compare this uh, uh, this structure uh, to uh, to the normal structure, let me go here. Uh, unfortunately, it's not coming through. Let me go back. Anyway, um, if I compare this structure to a uh, Pratt truss, a Pratt truss with the same deflection needs 68% more material because it's it's about turning turning the, the loads gently. And, and, and this is showing up in our architecture. Uh, this is a building that's under construction in China at the moment. Um, the um, Okay, uh, we, we use another tool uh, called you know force density, which was, which was uh, you know it, it kind of mimics you know the work of Fry Auto. I, I know Foster's office re quite recently 
had a had a proposal for the Mexico City airport where they did a hanging model too. And so you know we can do these, and, and it's very natural. And and, and so using the, these tools, uh, one of the things that I, for me is is, is quite interesting is um, let's, let's go to nature itself. In in nature, material is very expensive, and labor is cheap. So that, so they put the material where it's the most efficient, and and so. Um, you know, for 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 the problem that, that they're solving, and you know, and our predecessors studied this with models, and I want to talk a little bit about this one on the right, this uh, Fry Auto Soap film, which gave you these minimal surfaces where the stresses were the same in all direction. But what's interesting about this is the the soap film basically had no weight. So we we've been doing research, and what if you had heavy soap film? And if you look at these shapes here you will see that they look to be very organic because they have the same stresses in all directions, just like nature would do. In fact, what we call this the, the uh, sushi, sushi tray at the office, uh, you know, it, it feels like you want to get some chopsticks and eat one of those things, but you know, they, they're, they're, they're all very, very natural and, and, and organic. Uh, you know, there, there's also very good work coming out of ETH Zurich with our Rhino Vault. So I urge you to look at the work that they're doing. Uh, you know, we're doing uh, work and uh, using old technologies because it's called graphic statics, where you draw the structure and you draw the forces, and um, the uh, the image is disappearing here. But anyway, you can actually take a, a truss that looks like uh, this and make it into a self-stress structure. And there was an incredible observation that was done by James Clark Maxwell in the 1860s: is that for for this structure to be in equilibrium. It has to be a projection of a plane faced polyhedron. What the heck does that mean? It turns out that for any structure that's in equilibrium, you can draw in three dimensions a, 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 a polyhedron that where every panel is exactly flat and, and, the, um, and the change in angle between any two faces is proportional to the, to the force in, in the structure. And, and, and so as you look at this, this structure, you, you, you can see, uh, see, see how that works. And so we, we've been using this in the design of shell structures lately, or, or grid shells. So here is, um, and it turns out that three-dimensional polyhedron is something called the area stress function. And, and so what we've been doing, we've been drawing both the area stress function and, and the structure together and, and learning to design design them at the same time. And so uh, recently we built one of these about a year ago down in Madrid, where, where, where we built the, using old material with, uh, but with new technology. So you have a shell that's exactly in compression. And, 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 and uh, here are the images. And so, uh, uh, so I think there, there's a, and look how natural that looks. You know how elegant to me it's elegant, and how it feels like it's doing the right thing. How it flows, it flows in, in, in the sport in a very natural way. So I think digital and natural actually work together. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Uh, thanks for your presentation. It was really interesting. Um, first of all, we had a question again, and that was uh, within the design process, how do you cooperate flexibility within the structure of a building? So, for example, with the Burj Khalifa, they say that a lot of spaces are empty now. So did you anticipate in the design on how to cooperate with other functions within the building in the future? Uh, yeah, as I was said earlier, the most, most efficient thing is to not to build the new building, but reuse an old one. Yeah. And, and, and so um, one of the things, you know, we, we do to try to think about is, is, and we do this very subjectively, is the balance between uh, efficiency and flexibility. Uh, you know, one of the things, you know, you know uh, I love structure. I love expressing structure, but, you, but whatever you build, you're going to live with it forever. And so you got to think very, very strongly about where you put that column, uh, you know, because um, a lot of times, uh, uh, you know, at SOM, we have architects and engineers and interior designers and urban planners. And a lot of times, uh, the structural engineers, and the interior designers will get together before the architects are involved. And we will actually lay it out because, you know, where that column shows up can make a huge difference in how much building you have to build. 
or, or the different reuses. Uh, we, we recently did a, uh, a few years ago, we also did a timber tower study uh, where uh, we took an old, very, very efficient uh, concrete building, about 40 story tall, and, and redid it in timber. And, and one of the things that was part of our design criteria is flexibility. Because, uh, you know, can you like uh, take down that wall and buy your neighbor's unit? Can you re re repurpose the entire floor? And, and, um, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's this, this balance between um, least, you spending the least amount of carbon now versus uh, making a good investment for a building that, that, that's going to be around for a long time. You know, I, I'm here in Chicago, which, which has the curse and the blessing of very low rents, okay? Because of very low rents, you cannot afford to knock down a building, <laughs> okay? It's too expensive. So, so we do a lot of reuse. And then I, I do work in London all the time, and they will knock down something like this, uh, uh, you know, because the land value is so high and the rents are so high that, you know, the, you know the, uh, and so there's actually a different mindset in England about the reuse of buildings because it happens all the time uh, versus, uh, versus here where you kind of build it and it's going to be around for like forever. Uh, and, and, and so, uh, and, you, and, you, and, you're, and you will approach it different because, you, you know, in London, there's a high chance that your building has, because the land value is so high, you know, that, you, you know, the, uh, I've actually had buildings I built in London that are within my career that have been, they're not there anymore. They've been replaced by another building. And, and, and so, you know, it gives you a different mindset. Uh, and so I think it, it's going to be maybe somewhat uh, uh, based on the city and the land values of the city where you maybe have to be more conscious of one direction versus another. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, again, we have a lot of questions in the chat. And the first one is from Saskia. And she asked, how did you build the masonry form on your last slide? So that was the one with the four points at the bottom. Ah, which is very interesting. No, yeah. there, was, there was no false work. Okay. Okay. So uh, uh, we, we, we got a bunch of uh, masons from Spain. Okay, from you know Catalonia and Spain, and they know how to build these things uh, just by hand. And 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 saw that you saw that wood that was there. That was not false work. That was guidelines. Now, those were guidelines that the masons used uh, to keep them on track. But they, they we used no false work in that one. Uh, and so, um, you know, it, what they use is they use those tile bricks and, and the, the little strength of the mortar that they use is enough to do a little bit of cantilevering as they go, but there was no false work in that, in that masonry show. Yeah, impressive. Mm -hmm. um, and a question from Jose, and he asked, does high optimization lead to convoluted workflows with the parties involved in constructions and design of a building? So where's the limit of optimization? Well, you know, you know, uh, all this stuff needs to happen way early in the conceptual phase before things get too uh, locked in. You know, uh, you know, I mean, it's really the decisions you make at the very, very beginning have unbelievable. You know, you just can't undo them later. Okay, and and so you know, and the optimization I'm talking about is more conception. You know, get the right concept, the right topology, and, and a reasonably close approximation of the shape. Uh, you know, as 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 your as your as your basing points. Now later, uh, when people do their their kangaroo optimization things, you know that's fine. Uh, but uh, you, you know, on the sizing of, of the members and stuff like that. But it's really in the conceptual basis that you, you have to do it. And 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 so you know, and it's got to work for for the uh, you know for the owner. It's got to work for the users. You know, the, the, you know that's to be embraced by by all the disciplines, the architectures, the engineering, the. The, the, the building services, you know, uh, you know, the maintenance, the re all these things ha have to have to come come into play, but it needs to happen very early. Yeah. Okay. Um, and this is more of a discussion question. So also for Ron, the architects in this case, um, given that you look for the best possible design, should architects be given any space for adding novelty to a design? even though it would result in a deviation from a better design? Yes. Uh, you know, I mean, part of it, you have to create inspiration, okay? Um, you might say that the Eiffel Tower is a very expensive way to make a restaurant, okay? But, but you know, Paris would not be Paris without the Eiffel Tower. I mean, you need to have, you, you need to have inspirations. But I think there needs to be a, a reasonable, um, you know, 
I, I don't think it should go overboard. I think you can be quite quite creative um, with a reasonable constraint, but it doesn't have to be the lowest. It shouldn't have to be the lowest, uh, but it, it should be, you know, you know re re respond. Actually, uh, a lot of times um, we, we say uh, design is a search for constraints. And the more constrained you are, the more clever you have to be. Uh, and, um, and, and sometimes in, in, in cities that have way too much money, I see a lot of like, I call it silly architecture, uh, you know, too much, you know, guilting going on. Whereas if you're in a place where they, where it's, you know, where they, where they have limited resources, you know, they, and they want to do something that's really nice. They got to think really hard and work very hard to be creative, uh, you know, to, to and be, be very creative to make something that, that that's special and, they can actually afford to build. So, uh, I think uh, search for constraints is, is part of the design, and and ha and having embodied carbon as a constraint could lead to some very clever architecture. Okay, and what do you think about it, Ron? Well, I you know when I was um, uh, studying architecture in Delft, um, I remember my engineering friend uh, would always say, "Why why do you guys always start from scratch? Why do you why do you not take something that works well and just do it a thousand times?" You know, mm -hmm. and um, I, I I couldn't answer that question at the time, but now thirty years later, I've worked it out because it's um, architecture is also an, an optimization. It's an iterative process. We learn something from the past. We add a little bit of knowledge to it all the time. And uh, that's why um, the next um, 15, 20 years are going to be so exciting because there's so much innovation happening in so many fields and, and fields that are almost unrelated are starting to overlap. You know, it's really some incredible stuff will come out of it. And, and you know, frankly, I think without the hope that that will happen, um, we could have very little hope that we'd survive this planet, you know, um, this century. Because this, um, this, it's it's not going well. We're going to, you know, double the population almost in the next uh, thirty years. It's a nightmare. But I think because we we are communicating better, collaboration is getting more intense. People are more open to multi cross disciplinary um, uh, collaboration. That is where the uh, cool, really cool ideas are going to come from. And um, so, you know, if you want to be optimistic about it, it's because we do reinvent this, the wheel all the time. It, the wheel gets better all the time as well. Yeah, it's interesting in architecture, uh, I mean, at least in the, you know, PLP and SOM, I don't think we've ever did the same building twice ever, you know. <laughs> you boring know, as well, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Plus they take, you know, they take, uh, putting a building together for us takes often four or five years. It's a yep. long process. And then they stand for 50 years. And, you know, so they, it's not like, a, it's not a sketch a building. It's a huge uh, operation, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, a question more related to Bill's talk again. Uh, how much can you reuse the structural optimization models from earlier buildings and structures? So in your new designs, you already have some optimizations from your older designs. Uh, can you reuse them or implement them in some sort of way? Well, I'm going to interpret the question about componentry. And as Ron said earlier, I mean, we didn't. Uh, a lot of times we don't build buildings to take apart very well. You know, that's you know, you know, that's just you know, we haven't gotten there yet. Uh, but uh, you know, you know, you know, these designs where we're we're actually you know minimizing the you know, the use of the material is kind of where, where we are now. And the, the whole thing about, can you take these, these, uh, these, um, you know, the componentry and, and use it again? I think it's, it's an issue of scale. I think at smaller scale, I think that's a serious, serious opportunity. Uh, now, now going to, to the intellectual side of the optimization things, I'm, I'm amazed at what we're learning. Okay. Uh, you know, and, and you only learn if you start looking for it, uh, you know, uh, you know, a lot of these ideas that we, we've been coming up is because, you know, we've been looking, we did just doing like blue sky research by designers, which is quite interesting. Um, uh, you know, a lot, of, I, we don't have a research and, and development, uh, research and development department. Uh, all our research is done by people who are working on jobs because uh, uh, w what we find is that you know, a, a designer working on a project will find applications we never even imagined when we started. And a lot of our, the stuff we, we, we study is just totally blue sky. We just did it because we we're curious. Uh, 
and you know, and all that uh, area stress function um, stuff. Uh, you know, it's just stuff we were we we're just curious about. It. And then, and then, then we, we we find applications, and 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 so we keep on building this body of 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 optimization ideas or natural ideas or load flows or, or topologies and geometries. And, and, and it is in geometry where I, th I think largely architecture and structure comes together. It's through the, 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 the geometry, you know, like Ron's, Ron's building in, in, in Rotterdam, if you were to describe the structure, I think you, the words would be the same as if you're asked to describe the architecture. Uh, you know, it, it it would come out together. You know, and 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 so and and in the process, you'd use uh, geometric terms, and and so I think that, I think that's um, you know, uh, and, and so you know these geometries will change over time. Uh, this optimization, as we know more, and 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 hopefully we'll be able to create new and new architecture that's uh, that's better and more substantive than what we've done in the past. Okay. Um, then we have a question kind of for both of you. Um, the current COVID-19 epidemic has many people spending more time in their homes uh, than well ever before. Uh, do you think this will change some of the values we have towards uh, buildings that we build or that we design? Uh, Ron, I'll let you take that one first. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, I think yes, in two ways, because we are um, we are learning a lot from this time. We are learning that actually, you know, we can work from home. Um, I sort of stopped working from home when, when we started having babies because I just felt I, need, I needed separate lives for those things, you know, and the babies are now teenagers. They don't need me much anymore, so I have time. But um, there is, um, I have never w worked from home of course, as much as I do now, and I'm really getting into it. It's working really well. Parts of it are working really well. Other parts are not working well at all. Um, and uh, so we can find a mix. And I, I think personally that we, if it's gonna be the next year and a half or something, we'll be finding some intermediate way where we still work a little bit from home. We still work a little bit um, in the office where we need it. We're going to become quite specific about the types of, uh, activity that we do that we need to do together as a group uh, or types of activity that we are much better off doing in peace and quiet of our homes. And, um, you know, there are, um, there are real benefits to, uh, to the cities around us uh, because of COVID. You know, um, some Harvard um, uh, team um, worked out that the number of people who, who actually survived um, in China because of the drop in pollution levels is far outnumbering the people who died from COVID tenfold. So just stopping pollution in cities is so much more valuable than, you know, than uh, even than fighting a disease. Of course, we have to do both, but I think this, um, the learnings from this period are going to mean a lot to us. Um, in terms of buildings, um, on the one hand, we, we all agree now that buildings have to be far more flexible because they have to be, um, you have to be able to tune them to the situation a lot better. If you're going to work um, in a building with 50% occupancy and people are not supposed to be near each other at all, it's a different building. You know, you probably make them, uh, you, probably, you probably have a bit of trouble with your very, very tall buildings because you, you know, after you need to walk to the 76th floor, that's quite a task. Um, so um, um, circulation is going to be very, very difficult. But uh, also the homes, people, uh, if, you, if people have to stay at home, they, have, they need more um, uh, daylight probably in their houses than they have needed before. They need external space, balconies, uh, the orientation of rooms in the house is more and more important. Otherwise, you, uh, they will stop functioning as human beings quite soon. Um, so we're, we're learning that. And the hope is that uh, COVID will be over, over, but of course there are indications that these things might come along more often. You know, mm -hmm. um, it's really part of the bigger story about how we treat the planet and how we deal with the great numbers of people on top of each other and all the problems that that creates. So um, I think this flexibility drive is going to be very, very, uh, uh, you know, very useful additional layer of. Uh, of information we have to put in to build structures. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be. I'm very curious to see how that how how this is going to going to change. You know, um, 
of, of firms like PLP and SOM are we're, we're, we're urban people. We're urban. We're, we're you know, we've generally pushed for density for efficiency reasons and, and econ, you know, for the environmental reasons, you know, to minimize transit to get people to work together. And then this this thing is pushing it in the opposite direction. So we don't don't really know uh, how this is changing. But I, what I would do know is that I think designers need to be involved in the conversation. Uh, uh, you know. A few years ago, we did a project with one of the, one of the national laboratories uh, in, 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 the, in the United States, which probably has a thousand PhDs, all scientists and stuff like that. Uh, I don't think they could design themselves out of a paper bag. OK, uh, you, you know, you know, they you know, they need designers who think laterally to kind of like challenge them, you know, to, to push them. So I, th I think that there's going to be a lot of conversations, There's going to be a lot of scientists involved, but I think there need to be designers involved. Uh, who, who, who can who can help uh, come up with you know synthesize solutions from the information, which is what architects you know do all the time, and and, and so um, you know I, I think this is a you know a, a very you know uh, seminal place. But you know I remember uh, <laughs> uh, after 9/11, um, you know I was in Chicago and I, and I got a call from some of my buddies in New York. And so we put together a crew to go. We, the planes weren't flying yet, so we drove to, drove to New York to help out at Ground Zero after the 9/11 attack. And I and I was I was sitting there, you know, with all the things burning and the smoke and all that kind of stuff. And I was imagining um, that my 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 expertise in tall buildings uh, <laughs> was obsolete. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and then uh, two years later, I was hired to design the world's tallest building. So, uh, you, you know, it, it's it's hard to predict the future, but from now, it's gonna it looks very different. <laughs> so we'll, we'll have to see. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Really interesting. Um, I think for now that's it because we were already running out of time. <laughs> but that's fine. Um, so uh, first of all, there are kind. Of, quite some questions still in the YouTube chat. So um, Ron and Bill, are you okay with us sending the YouTube link so that maybe you can answer the questions uh, by writing over there if you would like to? Uh, so we will sure. send that to you uh, in a minute. And um, well, then first of all, uh, for the watchers at home, um, the whole stream can be watched back. We will upload it to our YouTube channel. So if you want to rewatch it or if you want someone else to let it watch, uh, that's possible. Um, then, uh, Daule, thank you for being here, being our streaming service uh, today. And um, finally, Ron and Bill, really thank you for uh, giving us this presentation and still making this uh, value design talk possible. Um, some small presents will be on your way, but that takes some time <laughs> since we can't deliver them to you physically. Uh, but we will be in contact about that, so that will be fine. And um, well, that's it for now. Uh, everyone, we hope to welcome you later this year after summer, hopefully, uh, on the Real Value of Design Symposium, but we can't say anything about that yet. Uh, but we really hope to still make it happen. And um, well, that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. It was, uh, it was a pleasure. Really, really nice. Yeah. And Bill, thank you. Great show. I just totally <laughs> love that stuff. So yeah, good. I enjoyed it. So good. Yeah, brilliant. Good. Thank you. Okay, cheers. Cheers, bye.